Hello everyone, my name is Cyrilda Summers McGee and I'm the founder and CEO of Workplace Change, a human resources firm located in Portland, Oregon. Welcome to Word on the Street. So you know that we come and bring a really direct communication and conversation about the state of human resources with up to the minute, up to date, um, real life scenarios and examples and solutions to challenges that folks are experiencing. And today we're gonna be talking about um, the civil unrest that's happening in America right now and in the world, quite honestly, um, around the state of black people in America. And so I wanted to bring forward um, two HR executives that I respect tremendously. They're black women who have been unapologetically black. And di like, blackness is not homogenous, it's not monolithic. We come in different shapes, sizes. We, we communicate differently. Mm -hmm. um, and so do these ladies. Like they communicate differently than me, but they are authentic expressions of themselves and black identity. And so I wanted to, to welcome them to my home because everything's kind of shut down, real mm -hmm. talk. Um, but also to get their perspective on their experiences as black professionals, black executives uh, in America and what we see with the black lens. So joining me today is Ashley K. Grundy. Uh, she is in charge of training and development as well as recruitment at the city of Portland. Um, and I've known Ashley, gosh, since Kaiser Permanente. We met at Kaiser mm -hmm. Permanente. Yes. Um, and then from there, Ashley went on to Willamette Dental and then to OHSU mm -hmm. and then to the city of Portland. And now she serves on the executive team um, reporting to the chief human resources officer. So welcome to Word on the Street, Ashley. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Oh, and then Tia Coachman. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Tia has been um, an HR crusader. I mean, mm -hmm. just a revolutionary since I first met her long ago um, when her babies were super small um, and she was at White and Kennedy and she moved up the ranks at White and Kennedy, then transitioned over to 247 Laundry Services as the People and Operations Director. People Operations, HR Director. HR Director, okay. <laughs> HR by another name is still HR. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and now Tia uh, owns her own company called Affirma Consultancy. So she's a human resources consultant for hire on the outside, pushing inward. And so um, I'm excited to have Tia be here and on the on the on the site on scene. Um, I'm I'm just a, a big fan of hers. Welcome to Word on the Street, Tia. Likewise, right on. Yeah. So I wrote an article. Um, and I had it published in the Portland Business Journal on Tuesday, and it was called "Are You Still Breathing?" You can be a part of the change. And basically the focus of the article was on basically juxtaposing or seeing the similarities of the violence and oppression and aggression that black people experience from police. Um, but, but basically showcasing that those same behaviors represent themselves, present themselves in the workplace mm -hmm. and drawing on the parallels of, um, of the experiences. And the reason why I felt it was super important to, to draw on those parallels is because I saw the outrage that um, our white, you know, allies and partners and friends were um, expressing, right? Like disbelief mm -hmm. that something like this could happen to uh, a black person that mm -hmm. could be treated in this way. And I'm like, okay, I mean, from the birder, and we're going to talk about Amy Cooper. Mm -hmm. Let's say say her name, yes. right? Amy Cooper. Mm -hmm. And all the billions of Amy Coopers that we know. We're going to get there. Okay. We're going to, can we get, we're going to get there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but people were outraged by that, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but that happens in the workplace. Like HR is weaponized all the time, all the time. in the workplace, mm -hmm. right? For, with an agenda. Right. Because they know exactly which levers to pull mm -hmm. that lead to certain people winning and certain people losing, mm -hmm. right? And so I wanted to just jump straight in. I'm just going to jump straight in. I want to I want to hear what has been your experience as a human resources professional as it pertains to the overpolicing of black bodies in the workplace. How have you seen it? How have you experienced it? How have I experienced it? Oh my goodness. So I've been in HR for about 15 years now. Um and the way that um HR professionals who are specifically black women, we walk in a door really having an assurance of what we know. And oftentimes that gets, um, that gets dismissed, hmm. you know? Um, and over time you start to mm -hmm. think, well, do I, do I know what I know? Mm 
right? Mm-hmm. Right, because I, I, I'm, I got the ear to the people. I got the heart of the people. The people trust me, mm-hmm. right? And I, and I have an understanding of what um, can move certain things forward. But then there's always this political agenda, huh. and it, you know, it, it puts some constraints around what you can actually do, the impact you can actually have. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's hard. It's a hard position to be in because the people are like waiting on you, right? right. Right. They're waiting for you. You're the helper. You're the you're the one that they come to lean on. Right. But then you also have to protect the business. Right. And protect the leaders. You know, and not only not just protecting them, but you got to take time to coach them through mm-hmm. making the right decision. That's right. Right. And sometimes so, unsuccessfully. Sometimes <laughs> unsuccessfully because sometimes they don't want, do what they, they want to do. They don't want to coach you because <laughs> we're consultants, right? Right. Not decision makers. Yeah. Right. Not decision makers. Mm-hmm. Facilitators, mm-hmm. facilitators of change, That's but right. other folks have to be invested in that change. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. So you you made you made this this statement, this point, and that is, um, and that is, people are waiting for you, mm-hmm. right? They are leaning on you. They are you you engender a feeling of hope. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that is? I mean, I know why, but I gotta ask you because you made the statement. Why do you think that is? Because I'm I'm taught I'm going around the organization saying I'm here for the people. Right. And then how many people in there look like you? Usually. Not a whole lot. <laughs> but I still gotta be there for everybody. That's right. That's right? right. And so if I'm if I'm making that that my platform, mm-hmm. I am here for the people, then the people have expectations of me. That's right. And when I make a recommendation about what needs to be done mm-hmm. and it gets shot down because you have an agenda, right. then I have to answer to the people. Mm-hmm. You do. Right? And I, I mean, clearly you also have to you also have to answer to your leadership. You do. Right? And so that's the the balancing act. That's the balancing act. Right on. And there's psychological impacts there as well. Oh my gosh. Right? It's traumatizing. Right. It is extremely traumatizing to For know home. that for well, us as an individual, <laughs> but also for the people. That's right. Who saw some hope mm-hmm. and then once again got let down. And got right? let down in your skin. In the right. skin. Yes. Your, they got let down, not by the system, because right. the system for minorities, especially for, you know, the system for black people is a white system. Mm-hmm. So when you come in and you're in the system, you're, 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 you're ingrained in it. And, and then you talk to them and they see you're real because mm-hmm. real recognizes real. Right. And you're looking All real familiar. Day, right. Right. Every day. right? Uh-huh. So they see it and they yes. believe it. And then you're unable to move the dial on that work. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm. It is traumatizing to you as a black exec because yes. dang, I have failed a group of people who have been failed so many times. Mm. So Grundy, in in your in your world, how have you seen black body bodies be policed in the in the workplace? I can definitely resonate with the, the silencing factor. Of, of trying to engage and implement change, but not being heard until it's a convenient time to impact mm. the executive. Preaching right? here, preaching. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, here comes that idea, right? Mm-hmm. That no one wanted to listen to. Mm-hmm. And for me, that has been extremely frustrating, mm. uh, perpetually. And then also hearing that same story from many people who are coming, looking to me for solutions. Around right. How can I move my ideas forward? Mm-hmm. How can I rise up? How can I grow when no one will listen to me? until it's an appropriate time for them to make a change and right. for them to grow. So really being suppressed from promotional and growth opportunities, it's it's incredibly real. And in addition to that, seeing people who are doing the right thing, showing up for work every single day, but they're a human being. Yeah. And something happens. Someone can be driving to work and get a flat tire. Mm-hmm. Get caught for an attendance issue that their supervisor is just waiting for that wait, moment. Just when they wait, when they wait yes. for you to mess up. We mm-hmm. were when we were getting ready and we were drinking our wine and and having our Jack and yes. Jack, like just getting just centered from a very hectic, <laughs> hard, hard week for this conversation. Mm-hmm. We were talking about how we've literally in human resources heard a person you know, through investigation, say, the staff will say, well, they said, you know, keep digging. We know she can't be perfect. Right. Right? Like, like stop and frisk equivalents in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Like, if I just keep digging, I'm going to find a moment when you're not perfect because Mm -hmm. no one 
is perfect. Mm -hmm. And then I got you because the consequence will be swift, mm -hmm. right? And unapologetic, there will be no mercy, there will be no grace. Mm -hmm. Unlike the people who don't look like you, where they get a lot of grace and extensions, you can see their humanity. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating to, to watch. Mm -hmm. Let's pivot really quickly sure. to Amy Cooper. <laughs> oh, Amy Cooper, I hope you watch this. I doubt you are going to, but <laughs> I hope somebody sends this to you. Actually, the world is talking about Amy Cooper at this point. Yeah. That's true. Right? Mm -hmm. And Amy Cooper was the woman who um, was a dog enthusiast. Uh, and she wanted her dog to run free because she felt like her dog had more rights and privileges than uh, a black man, apparently. Mm -hmm. And a birder, Harvard-educated black man, was in the in the park, top of the morning, looking at birds in the ground and in the air. I didn't even know that birds lived in the in the ground. I didn't know that was a thing until Amy Cooper. So shout out to Amy Cooper. <laughs> Um, I'm like, birds, birds are in the ground on purpose? Shout out for the lesson. Right? Like, right. on purpose? So, my man is sitting there, and he's like, yo, dogs disrupt the bird's habitat. Right? right? And it's a it's a leash law. Right. So, she flashes, and she, <laughs> and he's attacking me, and he's recording the whole thing. Nobody's attacking you. It was, it was, it was traumatic for me to even watch it, because I I know, like, we've been watching this since before Emmett Till, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where literally... When a person doesn't want to cop to, to something, you know, that they are perhaps doing wrong, they can they can weaponize and leverage a system that was built for them to, to win and for black men to, to lose. Right. right. And, and they always expect for it to work in their favor. OK, so when this happened and folks are like, I can't believe she did this. I'm like, my phone is teeming with group chats of black women. Like, how many Amy Coopers do we know? Mm -hmm. So let's just, can we just take a pause and talk about Amy Cooper? Have you ever seen an Amy Cooper equivalent in the workplace? Absolutely. When did, how does Amy Cooper look in the in the workplace? Oh, well, Amy shows up in all kinds of ways. Amy shows up in meetings, okay? She shows up as your manager, threatened by the great quality of work that you mm. are bringing to the table that they can't replicate. Um, okay, now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Amy shows up in all the ways yes. in the workplace. And um, some folks know and recognize the Amy and choose to ignore Amy. While others are stopped in their tracks because what can they do? What can they do? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, they can't just start taking a picture, you know, start, you know, recording right. in the meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, now they can. Well, and and, and, <laughs> and it's happening. And Trust it's happening. Me. Oh, but it's all, it's been happening since iPhones were flat enough to fit in your pocket or huh. in your 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 notebook. Mm -hmm. There were moments in my career, Tia, to that point, where I know that if it's my word against a white person's word, mm -hmm. even in my power of authority, mm -hmm. if they say Sarota was aggressive, <laughs> and do you know how many people to call me aggressive? Like I know I'm loud. I'm from Michigan. I, I got big gestures. I'm five foot eight. You know, I'm 175. Yeah, I, I got big hair. You said big afro, right? right? Uh, unapologetic afro, right? And um, and so the, you know, that was that was always very um stressful for me mm -hmm. to be in a room where people are um they could go and say something about me that wasn't true, and it could end my whole entire career that I've worked my whole life for, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And follow you. And follow, and, and it is going to be forever mm -hmm. on, on social media. It, it, I could never shake it. That mm -hmm. was always, you know, not only just the paranoia, but it had happened so many times where I felt on defense of myself in a room where a person is saying I did something. I didn't do that. And there was no way for me to justify it. So I actually have gotten to a place in my life where I'm like, I feel right now like this conversation is taking a turn. And mm -hmm. I'm now going to record mm -hmm. the conversation for moving forward mm -hmm. so that if you would like to move this forward to have a third party come and have a discussion right. about what has occurred, yeah. they have an actual account of what occurred, mm -hmm. right? That but that's the only defense mechanism that I have as a professional of color. So for to hear you say like you don't always have a phone, like that's all we have sometimes mm -hmm. though to protect that's all ourselves. All we have sometimes. That's fair. That's fair. It's it's awful, right? The, the devalue <laughs> and it's yeah, awful, right? The fact that that black people are devalued to the point that we feel like we have to record in the workplace at mm -hmm. times to to be heard, to be believed. But also think about the folks that witness the experience that you have or you had as an executive, right? And thinking about if I grow, if I go into leadership positions within this organization, am I going to have that same experience? Mm -hmm. Would I want to pursue that type of That's exactly opportunity? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 
utilizing the example that black executives have, especially in predominantly white areas, it suppresses right. people from even pursuing opportunities because of that mental awareness of what they are going to experience if they do. Yes. Mm. Yes. Well, well, Grundy, um, since you philosophizing, I want to <laughs> hear about your Amy Coopers. Have you ever seen an Amy Cooper? And I, and I like frequently. using her name in this way. Amy Cooper was dead wrong. It, it, there's no excuse for what it is that Amy Cooper did. And so, and so I am unapologetic in using Amy Cooper's name. So have you seen an Amy Cooper in the workplace? Absolutely. The, the person, even within human resources, Come on. who understands the policies, mm. so they understand how to find a loophole within the policy to move forward the objective of leadership. Mm. Right? Because oftentimes in organizations, they charge there for management. That's right. Not the employee. Mm -hmm. More times than not. Exactly. And so Amy Cooper in HR knows how the manager can get their way. Mm -hmm. Within the different departments, Amy Cooper shows up and she exactly, like the video, mm -hmm. knows exactly what to say, what script to follow to get the mm -hmm. action that she wants to occur. Let's think about who she called, right? right? She knew the police were going to come if she utilized certain words and raised her voice in the way that she did. That's right. Just mm -hmm. like folks know within the workforce. If they utilize certain words, HR is going to come running. That's right. And we have to. Right. <laughs> like, that right. is the balance. Even point. when we know better. Even when we know the truth is somewhere closer on the other side mm -hmm. of the spectrum, we still have to show up. We do. And do our due diligence yeah. and give everyone the fair shake. Right. And you take that information back and usually you go up the chain and you say, Here my, here's my recommendation based on this information. Um, and, uh, and then when they don't listen to that recommendation because of the agenda, mm -hmm. because of the politics associated okay. with it, it's that much more hurtful and harmful mm -hmm. to the people who were hopeful this mm -hmm. time around mm -hmm. when they spoke to you about right. their experience, that it would be better. Right. And it would be a different outcome. So you're dealing with your own trauma of not being believed mm -hmm. for your recommendation to not be um, reviewed as viable or appropriate, mm -hmm. right? So your own trauma right. of dealing with that, but then also the trauma that... Don't be an empath. Right. <laughs> don't be an empath and feel what that person feels because they had hope in you and you had to let them down. Let them down. Mm -hmm. It's exhausting. It is. It is exhausting. <laughs> It is. So I want to just check in with y'all. You know, as black women who practice the discipline of human resources, and you can see the what's this Chavin? What was that cat's name who put his his knee on? Ch I think it's Chavin. Last name J Chavin. Mm -hmm. Seventeen, twelve, like double digit citations for misbehavior, and they just kept letting it go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Everybody makes a mistake. Everybody makes a mistake. They can see his humanity. Right. You know, he didn't mean anything by it. Oh, you know, that's just jobbing. That's just, yeah, that's just, he didn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. But I mean, how many times have we seen that happen? Mm -hmm. Were they excuse bad actors? Were they excuse mean spirited people, bullies? When they excuse people who yell and ridicule and demean because they, look at their billable record. Right. Look at look at the things that they're able to create, that we're able to sell at this price point. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. We see it all the time. So I wanted to check in with you ladies. How are you feeling as a black HR executive who's who's been on the inside, who works on the inside, who continues to be a professional in this discipline? How y'all feeling right now? Exposed. Mm. Um, Tell me more. I was I was sharing this with someone the other day. I feel like to get through the days now as a you know external consultant, less so, let's be clear, much less so, but being in-house, um, you suit up in the morning with this armor of numbness, mm -hmm. right? So that you don't necessarily feel all of the pains. You can recognize them through the day, mm -hmm. but you don't feel them because they're feeling it will stop you in your tracks and you won't get your work done. Yeah. You won't do what you've been hired to do that day. <laughs> so you got to put on this armor of numbness. Um, and then at the end of the day, when you, when you take to taking that off, 
you're exposing, you start to feel it all. Mm -hmm. But you're in your home and you're safe. And there's someone maybe that can be like, it's all right, here's your glass of wine. (laughs) Right? Um, And now I feel just like my armor is so thin. Mm -hmm. I feel exposed. I feel like you folks can see. As as an executive, you can't show up in pain. No, Mm -hmm. you can't. But you got to take care of everybody else who's in pain. That's right. And protect them. And protect them. Mm -hmm. And you in pain yourself. (laughs) Right? And you can't expose that pain because what? It's not professional. You can't let your team see you like this. You're supposed to be the strong one. Always. 24-7. 24-7. Always on. Mm -hmm. Right? So I feel exposed. I feel like people now get to see that Tia, the the HR director, or Tia, the HR consultant, can also feel pain by this stuff. And guess what? I still got to get up every day and help everybody. And power through. And power through. Yeah. But now you get to see it. Because I can't. It's thin. My yeah. armor's thin. Mm-hmm. My numbness, the pain, the, the medicine is wearing off. That's right. That's right. Grundy? I just feel raw right now. This ultimately exposes an incredibly good word because people see exactly what the or claim to understand or have eyes open around what the black experience is in the workplace. And that's confusing as well. Yeah. Uh, being that this is not new. This is not a new conversation. This is not something that has not happened before. Yeah. And it's a bit frustrating to see that it took a man placing his knee on another human being for eight minutes and 46 seconds for there to be this awakening that change needs to happen. And so it's confusing to really understand what the future holds. And of course, it's, it's an opportunity to be a part of dismantling and deconstructing a lot of the, the issues that have perpetuated supremacy in this nation, but is this going to go away in in two weeks or are allies going to be geared up and supportive to continue to drive this train change when the riots stop yep. or when the protests stop? Mm-hmm. Time will tell. Mm-hmm. Is it a trend, right? Mm-hmm. Ha- another hashtag. Right? Another hashtag. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Another hashtag. Yeah. You know, um, Grundy, you made a point just a bit ago, and you said, um, is it is it okay to say that I feel like a part of the problem? <laughs> and we had an entire conversation about that, that we've kind of dibbled into, you know, throughout the course of this exchange that we've been recording. Tell me more about, about that statement that you made. It's difficult not to feel like a part of the problem and the construct that is oppressing people and has oppressed people historically when I don't have the power to change anything, right? Being a black executive, as we've talked about, there's a lot of um, a weight that comes with it, mm-hmm. right? People have been seeking me out all week long to That's talk bad. about the experience <laughs> that they're having. In the work. In the workplace, mm-hmm. exactly. And what's HR going to do? How is HR going mm-hmm. to change? Mm-hmm. And I want to have those answers and I want to be able to say, we are going to have a solution for you tomorrow, but I'm powerless to say that I can. Right. And so I am, I am in in some parts part of a problem other than being a listening ear to people and bringing the concerns and the facts forward to the people who can make a change. Right. You know, um, and that was the very reason why, look, I love human resources. Mm -hmm. I love, the potential that human resources has, right? There's so much power and authority wrapped up into the title of human resources. Mm -hmm. And if we were to use that power for good, imagine what this, what the workplace could be for folks who have historically been voiceless and exploited for just for talent, right? Not, not to have ownership, not to be able to make fundamental changes Mm -hmm. to systems so that they are more inclusive, for the next generation to come, for their babies themselves to not have the same experiences that they have had in the workplace. Mm -hmm. 
<sighs> that is the reason why I went into HR was to have an impact. But once I got into HR, I, 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 I saw very quickly that it was it was the political ep epicenter of most most organizations. And the most effective place I have found to make an impact and, and to influence change in organizations is from the outside. Mm -hmm. It's when they're paying you top billable hour mm -hmm. to bring you in and then they listen. And they what listen. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's crazy fascinating? So, that, you know, there was a time where, where, you know, as I was preparing, like, am I going to go out on my own or, you know, um, am I just going to stay and be an in-house HR professional? And I would literally, you know, hear myself giving advice to my current employer and then be like, you know, they can't even hear it. They can't even hear the perspective. <laughs> and then saying it to a client, like maybe, maybe it doesn't make any sense. Let me try this with, with an, and you know, a third party mm -hmm. and then being like, genius, <laughs> brilliant. Don't get on here and tell my whole story. <laughs> and, 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 and I feel like this is insane to me. Mm -hmm. On the inside, it's incredibly challenging to influence change as an HR practitioner and perhaps for other disciplines, but I'm an HR you know, right. executive. Because all of the politics associated with the organization are present. She's just trying to get more authority, mm -hmm. more power. She's just trying to take, 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 take out such and such over there. She, wait a minute. I'm trying to stop y'all from hurting people. This, that doesn't have anything with me to do with me trying to take Jack's job. I don't want Jack's job. First of all, you know what? I'm I'm back off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm about to go someplace. <laughs> if I wanted Jack's job, I'd have Jack's job because I'm a go for it. Right. Yes. We can tie all this back down to the bottom line, to the triple hey. line. We can do. This. We can do this. Right. But that is not our priorities on these people. People and culture, how they feel when they come show in the workplace yes. so that they can be the best <laughs> versions of themselves. Right. right. And if they do that, then guess what? They're going to perform better. Come on. Your work is going to be higher quality. It's going to be in better demand. Mm -hmm. All and the guess things. What? You're going to get all this money. I got you on the money. Take care of the people. <laughs> hey, listen to me. They wouldn't hear me on the inside. So I went to the outside. You yeah. know what? They listen now. And yeah. that, I mean, I'm not, I'm not like, I, we have to have people on the inside. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying flee HR. Please. But I am <laughs> saying that if you feel like you have a calling mm -hmm. to do more and to bring more to the yeah. conversation, then they're willing to hear. Yeah. Then there are other options out there. Yes. You, you're not trapped and you're not stuck. There are other options. Let me just mm. super sidebar. I want your opinion on this. I'm super upset with Sherm. Mm. Mm. Sherm has been like, <laughs> from COVID to to the to that crying out of black people. Mm -hmm. Sherm's response has lacked luster. It has demonstrated why human resources is a is a fundamental part of the problem. Right. And I just want to say, like, I have I've always had so much respect for Sherm. Yeah. Like Sherm is the preeminent entity for a discipline that I have dedicated my mm -hmm. life to. Right. And for them to show up as they did for black people, I am. I, it's more than d disappointed. Like, I'm disgusted to mm -hmm. a certain extent. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, we've been lamenting for a little bit here, okay? So now um, I want to get to possible solutions. And again, these aren't all the solutions. This isn't, you know, this is a comprehensive. If you want comprehend, co a comprehensive solution plan for your ecosystem, uh, you can call a firm I can call. <laughs> you can call workplace change. <laughs> Um, and our squad will be deployed immediately to help right. you actualize real workplace change. I named my company Workplace Change for a reason. Right. I want to see workplace change happen so people right. who look like me can stop being traumatized. So in the article that I referenced um, um, a bit ago from Portland Business Journal, it's also um, linked to this video. Um, I talk about five solutions, right? Like there are parallels. There are parallels to Officer Ch Chavin or whatever his name is. He had been in trouble several times and the system did not discipline him and get him back in line or transition him out. Mm -hmm. He was able to harm people and God only knows how many people he got to mm -hmm. harm. Just that day, he happened to kill someone. Mm -hmm. And there have been Amy Coopers in the workplace and you allow that trash to continue to just keep moving forward mm -hmm. as if, you know, it's not hurting you today. So therefore, there's no problem. Mm -hmm. And that's not acceptable. HR has got to act. So I came up with five ideas. I would like to hear your your feedback on it. I mean, okay. I, real talk. Like, mm -hmm. if y'all got something, if I miss one, if you feel like, let's pivot it to real, let's talk about it because I'm about change, okay. right? So number one, to address these systems of oppression and these problematic behaviors that occur in the workplace, I said, you've got to address bias and, and gossip. Mm -hmm. Gossip and bias. Bias and gossip. In the epicenter. I think I call it that. I'm like, oh, I call them gateway.
gateway drugs. The gateway drugs. <laughs> gateway drugs to yeah. dysfunctionalism in yeah. an unhealthy work environment. What do y'all think about gossip and assumptions that are happening in the workplace? Perception is everything. Perception is reality. And so if you have gossip running rampant in your organization, you are you are uh, uh, coloring a picture that may or may not be true about someone. And we are talking about their livelihood. Their livelihood forever. Right? We're talking about even, in some cases, their identity. Come on. Right? Because I am a designer or I am a whatever, right? They, you're an HR executive. You live and breathe HR. Okay. And then if there's gossiping about your, your ability to do what you know you are put here to do, that you can't, like, we, we, we have to squash it. These workplaces cannot be high schools. <laughs> Can you hashtag that? Because <laughs> <laughs> you got to go through high school to get to these jobs, okay? So we can't we can't revert. We can't revert back. So I'm so glad that's your number one. Number one. Grundy, how you feel about gossip and assumptions? Yeah. I'm thinking about the thematic gossip. Just mm -hmm. generally speaking, mm -hmm. thinking about the stereotypes applied to people of color, black aggressive. folks. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Black folks are aggressive. I They're difficult to manage. To exactly. Exactly. And how it it closes the door for more to come in. Absolutely. Right? We work incredibly hard mm -hmm. to diversify candidate pools. Yes. But because of the gossip and the perceptions within the workplace, mm -hmm. the doors close, the minds close to actually making the hire. Can I bring this into a, little, a performance review? Yeah, let's do it. So, specifically around black women, mm -hmm. right? So, there's a stereotype of the black woman that's more like, you know, me and Sabrina, with, we, we're loud and we use our hands and we're, we're, you know, we're, we're, we get real close with folks, you know what I mean? Not every black woman is like that. Not every one of them. Right? Exhibit, right? right? <laughs> as, as, as we look at you, right? Like, that's the homie. Right. You ain't gonna get all of this. Right. It's always gonna Right. Be. But guess what? <laughs> if you don't smile, mm. if you don't chit-chat with mm. folks, if you aren't as, um, you know, as outgoing mm -hmm. as folks like us, yes. you know, then the, the rumor mill is, she don't like me. That's right. Well, exactly. well, that has actually happened to me on multiple right. times in regards to performance evaluation right. that I'm not open. You're not yes. open. And I was told that I need to share more about my personal life. That's mm. right. Be funnier, mm. please. And let's be clear. Yeah, people are funny. This goes on your performance review, which follows you. Yes. In some organizations, it follows you further than in others. Some some leaders just don't care about performance reviews. Let's be clear. <laughs> While others will base your whole career on what rating you got and what your last manager said about you. And so And that manager could have been a sucker. Right. <laughs> and you could know this manager is problematic. Right. And you still base this person's entire livelihood off of what that, person, that person, said. person said and you come on. Okay, I'm sorry. What are we doing? Oh we doing great on time. <laughs> Kinda. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering right. what a wine is. <laughs> <laughs> many of these oppressive systems and problematic behaviors that are happening in the workplace that disproportionately impact black people and mm -hmm. people of color and other marginalized communities is bias awareness. Mm -hmm. We all have them. Yeah. We, we know that they exist, but like uh, awareness is step one. Action is step two. Like you're allowing your, your bias to dictate who can come into the organization or not. What do you think about that being number two to establishing some changes of the status quo in workplaces? There has to be accountability to change behavior oh. based upon what people Number are three! Doing. Can we just fast That's forward? <laughs> Literally, from bias awareness, I went intentionally to accountability. Mm -hmm. Because you can have awareness all day long, and you can preach, and you can pontificate mm -hmm. all day long, and then people go right back to business as usual, and there's no accountability for change. Change. Mm -hmm. Right? So what do you think about number three being accountability? Holding people accountable to living into the values and expectations that you have, especially as it pertains to leaders. But let's be clear. How can you hold others accountable if you don't hold yourself accountable? There, mm -hmm. there we have Right? It. Is that not what we are experiencing with some of these leaders? If they don't even hold themselves accountable and therefore don't know how to hold others account accountable. Some folks And in some mm -hmm. cases... They know, mm -hmm. 
and they don't care. They choose not to. Or they know what they have. They're so conflict avoidant. Mm. Oof. Where we live, ladies, the Pacific Northwest. Ooh, yes, that's Portland, Portland nice. nice is a real oh, thing. Yes, <laughs> the center of passive aggression yes. or just passivity or just avoidance, mm -hmm. top to bottom, only to allow you to live in the in the trauma that's happening all around you. Because from the, your leaders are not going to step in, even when they say, "I know that that's not right. Mm -hmm. I know that that's problematic." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Y'all get to figure it out. Y'all figure it out on your own. Because mm -hmm. if they if they disrupt too much, right, it's their position. Right. They get to have the same type of bias or, or stereotypes associated with mm -hmm. them because of the actions that they're taking. It's self-preservation. Mm -hmm. Self-preservation. Fear. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was number three. Number four, I said consistency. And mm -hmm. when I say consistency, I'm literally talking about Establishing an equitable environment, meaning if I'm going to reprimand you and discipline you for coming in 15 minutes late today, right. then every other person who darts that door mm -hmm. on my team 15 minutes late, right. everybody's going to get the same discipline. Right. Does that happen? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. It should. Right. It, it should. It should. No, it does no. not. Subject to ma uh, manager supervisor discretion. And sometimes if they have their coffee that morning. <laughs> right, the mood that they are in and the person that comes to them. That that's and that and then when you put that reality onto black skin, mm -hmm. the system, mm -hmm. the game is rigged. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. There's already gossip uh, surrounding you, right? Right. There's already biases about you. There's already low accountability for your manager, right? Mm -hmm. And then you come in and it's an inconsistent treatment. Mm -hmm. Right. What in the world's gonna happen to you? Well, the likelihood of you getting promoted is not likely. The likelihood of you being fired um, um, or, or disciplined mm -hmm. more aggressively than your peers, very likely. Mm -hmm. And the likelihood of you having to be on Ativan, Prozac, right. and a variety of, right. of right. other right. Um, right. anxiety drugs in order to show up every single mm -hmm. day right. is also high. Because right. you just need to be able to feed your babies and or your family. Yeah. Then your performance review is going to be, might be a little bit accurate because your performance is going to, it should. Right. How, how, how can it not? How can it but not? How it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? right. Yep. If that is what you're being told, and if yep. that's the experience that you're receiving in the workplace, then why wouldn't somebody's performance be, be impacted? Yeah. That's exactly right. What I find really interesting about this conversation is that there are, we have worked in very different organizations. Very mm -hmm. different. Okay. And we're all experiencing, observing, mm -hmm. recognizing, all of the same things. The exact same things. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? <laughs> it means there's a whole lot of work to do. <laughs> and a lot of it is not ours to do. To be quite honest. Absolutely. A I agree with that. A lot of it's not ours mm -hmm. to That's do. That's very true. Now, we might be able to direct some folks, but the work mm -hmm. is on... Of change. Uh, the cha yeah, the change... Mm -hmm is on some other folks. That's right. It's mm -hmm. not on us. Mm -hmm. And it's been on us. It has that full burden. Full. And the consequences <laughs> associated with if things don't go right, right? Like, okay, help us get more diverse and then help us have a more inclusive environment. And then they don't listen to anything that you say. And then there's an uproar for the people that they've imported into their organization, mistreated inside mm -hmm. of their organization because they didn't do any of the work to actually, we, we didn't have the diversity. Mm -hmm. And now it's HR's fault that our diversity is revolting. Right. Oh, wait, hold on, partner. <laughs> well, a lot of that has to do with preparation to retain, right? You can't just come out here and say, go and go and hire me some folks. That's right. Right? Because without doing your work. Without doing your work. Mm. Because guess what? I'm gonna show up on my part. I'll get you the people. But are you gonna support them? Or do you gonna have the infrastructure in place to support them? Are you going to have infrastructure in place to develop them? Right. Right? Do they know you want them here and you want them to grow? Right. I mean, did you just say it? Like simply. Mm -hmm. Can you I mean there's Or maybe you tweeted it. Or maybe right. Right. Because you did it outside, but not inside. here. Mm -hmm. Inside. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's work to be done um, at every stage, at every stage of this employee life cycle. It really is. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and there's absolutely work to be done externally to rebuild trust. Right. So right. with we're out there building relationships, telling folks, please come, please come to our organization. You'll have a great experience. And then they get here. And they don't. Right. Huh? And then they go home and talk to their friends and family. Right. right? Why would anybody? choose to come to that organization. Right. That's exactly right. 
Why would you? Unless unless you had to. Like the top talent who can go anywhere in the world, why would they choose you? Especially as an underrepresented, historically underrepresented person right. inside your ecosystem. Right. Why would I come to you mm-hmm. when you haven't done the work? All right. So the last one that I have is courage. Mm. Right? Courage. You have to have the courage to stand out in front <laughs> and say, I'm going to make things different come hell or high water. Mm-hmm. Because people are going to push back. Everybody likes change, mm-hmm. right? Until you have to. Until you got to do it. <laughs> right? Everybody's like, oh, I'm, I love change. I'm a big proponent of change. Yeah. And then it's like, hey, hey, when you said that to such and such, that 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 really hurt their feelings and, mm-hmm. and made them feel disempowered and disrespected. Well, I don't know why they would feel that way. Well, I don't know. Like, whoa, 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 change agent. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were about this life. Right. <laughs> So, so courage, courage to be steadfast, yeah. courage to, to innovate, courage to bring in experts and listen to them, courage to listen to the voices that have been in your ecosystem requesting, pleading for you to make systemic shifts and you never listened to them. Mm-hmm. You never were willing to hear them. Courage to own that you never were willing to listen to them and now you're ready, right? Yeah. And for, like, you know what? You have been talking about this for five years. Mm-hmm. Susan? Right. My bad. Getting right. Right. Let's talk about what your plan is and, and how we can empower you to activate that plan right. or get experts to come in to fortify you in, in implementing that plan. Right. Right. So courage was the last one. What are your thoughts about courage being the final, the final piece of this puzzle? And there's a, there's a storm, a massive stor- storm to weather right now. Yeah. So mm. it must continue. People, we have to be ready and be courageous to be steadfast right yeah. now. And to your point, Listen to people, listen to the voices of others, especially leaders. Yeah. It is not up to us to make a decision in a vacuum. Yeah. It is up to us to listen, to respond, and to be objective and to be innovative and not to look at what we've always done right now. Right. Right. It, it's the natural tendency to resort to the status quo. But now it's is the easy. opportunity. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's always easy. Right? It doesn't build muscle. But now's the opportunity to really do something different and to stretch our minds to be courageous enough to to say what what we're thinking, even though mm-hmm. it may sound completely and totally different than what our peers may have heard before. Yeah. Now's the time to be courageous to 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 think about the impossible. Mm-hmm. I love it. How you follow that? Good goodness. <laughs> um, you know. To me, courage is the flip side of of, ha- of being full of fear, mm-hmm. right? Fear of admitting that you could do this wrong. You know, you cannot get this right, right? And still doing it anyway, right? Courage is, to me, the, the um, what comes when you are empowered. And that's why when we, when I, whenever we're, I'm talking about accountability, I'm always talking about balancing it with empowerment. Right. Because, you know, someone has to move in order for you to hold them accountable to it. So give them what they need to move. And a lot of a lot even it's not just about giving them what they what they need, but as for your own self. Doing the work where you feel. That you have the capacity to do it. Right. Doing that first internal work to say, okay, I. I can stand up for someone else because I understand their experience because I've done my work in researching mm-hmm. how, you know, how these things can unfold for them, mm-hmm. you know? So you do your own work first. Do that first. Mm-hmm. Then find ways to balance empowerment and accountability right. in, in, any, in any, every situation. Um, and courage will show up. So, ladies, I want to thank you for joining me for this um, cathartic conversation. Like, yeah. this has brought some serenity into my spirit. Like, I have been anxious, at times overwhelmed, mm-hmm. trying to figure out, like, what do we do in this moment? How do we coach in this moment? Because this moment matters so much. Mm-hmm. It is so important that we do right by this moment that we're in. Yeah. And so I want to thank you for watching Word on the Street. I want to thank you for listening to Tia Coachman with the Firma Consultancy. Um, she's the owner-operator of it, and she is an HR savant. Uh, she's been 
on the inside as an HR practitioner for a long time now, okay? She's seen it all, and she's bringing the best practices and, and, and helping to untangle and unweave the worst practices that exist out there uh, to help you become a stronger and better organization. Ashley Grundy's still on the inside for now. <laughs> um, but 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 Grundy, I thank you for coming into the show just to um, to share your perspective because what I love most about you, among many things, is uh, your your big brain <laughs> mm. and and how you process information to get to very impactful, um, thoroughly processed uh, and 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 you know, assessed and triangulated solutions for people. So keep doing that good work. Keep doing it at the city of Portland. I love what you're doing at the city of Portland. I love what the whole team, not just the, I have a little bite. I, I used to be there with the team. The team worked hard to, to change systems that have existed well before we were there and that will exist well after we're there. So keep doing that great work and thank you for your contribution to this conversation today. Thank you. Um, my point in closing is that what happened to George, to Ahmad, to Brianna, to, uh, um, you know, with Amy Cooper. Um, those moments happen in the workplace as well, and I need you to see the parallels. I need for you to be as outraged about what happened on the streets to um, people just living their lives, just going for jobs, just, you know, going to the, to the corner store, just sleeping in the bed, mm. um, and just bird watching. Those things happen every day to unsuspecting black people in the workplace. Um, and you watching this show right now to do something to change that. And I hope we've given you a few tools and a little bit of perspective on how you can um, achieve change in your workplace. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and thanks for uh, listening to Word Over Streets.